Well, welcome in the name of Christ. Now, normally I would say uh, everybody stand up and, and greet one another, but, I, you know, oh, I'm, I'm looking at somebody right up there through a window, and he's got headphones on, but I don't think he's listening to me because he's doing this. <laughs> That's Tyler. Hello, Tyler. <laughs> he looks like he's on a game show, you know, some sort of. Uh, well, anyway, I wouldn't, I would, I can't have y'all, you know, shake hands and and such. So what I'd like you to do is, if you would, if you could, could you stand up? If you could, you stand up. Um, and uh, y'all in the front turn around and just face one another. And and wait, wait. wait because we don't want to communicate the viruses, right? So I want you to say greetings, but say it this way. Welcome. You know, just point at it. Welcome. So let's welcome one another. Okay, very good, very good. Now you understand? <laughs> He's the one that's safe back there. Um, and, <laughs> and you understand, I, I, I just heard on the radio when I came over here, you, you're not supposed to wave anymore because that stirs the virus up, you know. So we, we are no longer waving and they're checking on breathing uh, because they have found definitively that breathing makes one susceptible to the virus. So. Uh, we, we're going to stop doing that. What? Are you going to preach to dead people then? <laughs> you know, I've preached in a lot of churches. Sometimes it's hard to tell. <laughs> well, welcome. Welcome in the name of Christ. Uh, oh, one other thing that I need to tell you. You drink, coffee. You're drinking coffee. coffee. I my, my, my mom said if you, you shouldn't do it if you didn't have enough for everybody. Okay, that's okay. Uh, I'm going to make her mad so she quits. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> no, I'm not gonna. Now, uh, if you don't, if you haven't realized, I am not from this part of the country. I am from the southern part. Southern part. Southern right. From the south. You know. Uh, and so, just to let you know, if you hear me say. Y'all, I don't want you to assume I've started speaking in tongues. Uh, because, of course, we don't do that in the Presbyterian church. You know, Presbyterians with the Holy Spirit. You know, you can tell Presbyterian with the Spirit. Uh, so, I'm not speaking in tongues. What you need to do is mentally translate it to yuns. Okay, so uh, are there, you got announcements in your bulletin, uh, you, you need to hear it again? I don't think so. All right, well that's, that's good, so brothers and sisters, as God's people, let's worship him together. Through the gift of the Holy Spirit, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all, let us worship God. Lord God, your presence is here with us. For that, we are incredibly great, grateful. Inspire us with your spirit, the spirit that flows around and through us. Help us to become closer to you and closer to one another through this worship and praise of you. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Let's all stand up and sing six, hymn 670, Glorious Things of Thee Are Spoken.
You all may be seated. Oh, no. No. I, <laughs> see, I told you, in, in my church, we, we all set, would sit down. So, but you all could stay, because I see the little asterisk by, by that. Uh, God's gift. <laughs> I love being in, in different <laughs> churches with different orders. Uh, God's given us a great opportunity to confess our sins to Him. This is part of our preparation to hear God's Word. And since we commit sins not only as individuals, but also as communities, uh, it's appropriate that we pray to Him and confess as a community. And that's what we'll do by praying the prayer in the bulletin. And then we'll follow it with just a brief time of individual and personal confession. Uh, don't, don't smile at me. Oh, on that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I appreciate that. Well, when I'm doing good, if you could wink, that, that would be good. If I'm, if I get it right, you could just wink. That's don't think anything of it, darling. Uh, so let's go to God now in prayer. God of mercy, you sent Jesus Christ to seek and save the lost. We confess that we have strayed from you and turned aside from your way. We are misled by pride. For we see ourselves pure when we are stained, and great when we are small. We have failed in love, neglected justice, and ignored your truth. Have mercy, O God, and forgive our sin. Return us to the paths of righteousness. Lord God, in the silence that follows, hear now our prayers, and, and Lord, have mercy on us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for listening to us. And of course, thank you for loving us as much as you do. But right now, we thank you for forgiving us. And, and we, we know that we've been forgiven. In fact, we know we've been cleansed because we've lifted these prayers up in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. Brothers. <laughs> it says declaration of forgiveness. Okay. I was about to declare forgiveness, but if, if you want them unforgiven, I'm okay. You know, they seem like nice people. Please forgive them. Okay. <laughs> Is it all right? Okay. <laughs> I love it. In the, in the word of the gospel, this saying is sure and worthy of universal acceptance that Jesus Christ came to save sinners. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross that we might be dead to sin and alive to all this good. Brothers and sisters, in Jesus Christ you are forgiven. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> now I saw in your bulletin you got a, a prayer guide which I think is, is really cool to guide your prayers during the week. So you want to remember those names. Are there any other folks that you might want to put on this list? Yeah. Oh good. Well, and, and that really points to something we probably need to keep in our prayers. This, this, the whole coronavirus, and particularly those who've been infected, especially folks that have compromised immune systems, uh, for whatever reason, the very young and the very old. Uh, we want to keep them in our prayers because it's a, it could be a very dangerous situation for them. And since it's global, you know, it's, it, I think that uh, those prayers are, are needed. Yes, ma'am. One sister, Gwen Moore, is 
finally out of the hospital, but she's still going through a lot because she's going to have to have surgery to remove a cancerous cyst from her liver. Oh, my. And I didn't see Bob Cunningham here this morning, so I'm sure that Bob and the family need our prayers. The flowers are from his wife's funeral this past week. Oh, my. Yes, absolutely. She's in the hands of God. She's fine. Yes, she but it's the, it's the family left behind that we need to remember. So thank you. Thank you so much. Any, anybody else? Anything else? Anything good? Well, that's, that's fine. You, you're out of school for, for a while. <laughs> that's, that's good for you. Not good for, what's that? It's a, it's a mixed blessing. I was going to say it's not good for all of us. Uh, <laughs> but let's go, let's go to God in prayer. Now, I know you've had... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I know you all been doing a, a, a prayer of intercession during Lent, so, so let's do that together. Jesus, remember us when you come into your kingdom. Your kingdom come. For your church around the world, we ask new life. Your kingdom come. For all who carry out ministries in your church, we ask grace and wisdom. Your kingdom come. For people who have accepted spiritual disciplines, we ask, uh, we ask inspired discipleship. Your kingdom come. For Christians in every land, we ask new unity in your name. Your kingdom come. For Jews, Muslims, and peoples of other faiths, we ask your divine blessing. Your kingdom come. For those who cannot believe, we ask your faithful love, your kingdom come. For governors and rulers of every land, we ask your guidance, your kingdom come. For people who suffer and, and sorrow, specifically those in our community and our nation who are dealing with great loss, as well as those whom we have named earlier and whom we lift up to you in silent prayer. We ask for your healing peace, your kingdom come. God of love, as in Jesus Christ you gave yourself to us, so may we give ourselves to you, living according to your holy will. Keep our feet firmly in the way where Christ leads us. Make our mouths speak the truth that Christ teaches us. Fill our bodies with the life that is Christ within us. In his holy name we pray. And let all the people say, Amen. Amen. Now, let's all stand up and let's sing with enthusiasm hymn 245, What Wondrous Love Is This?
Please be seated. They didn't know that one. I, I, um, I suspected that, uh, that they, they, they didn't. Um, and, uh, but I'll, I'll tell you something. Y'all did it, and a diminished number and all. You did it so well. I think you deserve a round of applause. So give yourself a round of applause. I think that is outstanding. Uh, Trudge, <laughs> trudging through a hymn that you had sung before. Uh, let's have a word of prayer. Lord God, you are present here. Inspire us now. We're about to hear your word read and we're about to hear your word proclaimed. Work that word within us so that we can apply it to our living. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. We got, we got quite a few passages of Scripture. Now, if you've got Bibles with you, you may want to use them. Now, all of these I'll be reading from the contemporary English version, so uh, it may not conform to the Scripture you're reading. So, uh, but please, feel free to, to read along. The first lesson comes from the Old Testament, the book of Exodus, 17th chapter, beginning with the first verse. The Israelites left the desert and moved from one place to another each time the Lord ordered them to. They camped at Raphidim, but there was no water for them to drink. The people started complaining to Moses, Give us some water. Moses replied, Why are you complaining to me and trying to put the Lord to the test? But the people were thirsty and kept on complaining. Moses, did you bring us out of Egypt just to let us and our families and our animals die of thirst? Then Moses prayed to the Lord, What am I to do with these people? They are about to stone me to death. The Lord answered, Take some of the leaders with you and go ahead of the, the rest of the people. Also take along the walking stick you used to strike the Nile River. And when you get to the rock at Mount Sinai, I will be there with you. Strike the rock with the stick and water will pour out for the people to drink. Moses did this while the leaders watched. The people had complained and tested the Lord by asking, Is the Lord really with us? So Moses named the place Masha, which means testing, and Meribah, which means complaining. And from the Psalms, the 95th Psalm. Sing joyful songs to the Lord. Praise the mighty rock where we, where we are safe. Come to worship him with thankful hearts and songs of, of praise. The Lord is the greatest God, king over all other gods. He holds the deepest part of the earth in his hands. And the mountain peaks belong to him. The ocean is the Lord's because he made it. And with his own hand, he formed the dry land. Bow down and worship the Lord, our creator. The Lord is our God and we are his people, the sheep he takes care of in his own pasture. Listen to, the Lord, to God's voice today. Don't be stubborn and rebel as your ancestors did at Meribah and Masha out in the desert. For 40 years they tested God and saw the things he did. Then God got tired of him and said, you never show good sense and you, and you don't understand what I want you to do. In his anger, God told him, you people will never enter my place of rest. And then from Paul's letter to the Romans, the fifth chapter, by faith we have been made acceptable to God. And now, because of our Lord Jesus Christ, we live at peace with God. Christ has also introduced us to God's undeserved kindness on which we take our stand. So we're happy as we look forward to sharing in the grace of God. But that's not all. We gladly suffer. Because we know that suffering helps us to endure. And endurance builds character which gives us a hope that will never disappoint us. All of this happens because God has given us the Holy Spirit who fills our hearts with his love. Christ died for us at a time when we were, we were helpless and sinful. No one is really willing to die for an honest person, though someone might be willing to die for a truly good person. 
But God showed how much He loved us by having Christ die for us, even though we were sinful. But there is more. Now that God has accepted us because Christ sacrificed His own lifeblood, we will also be kept safe from God's anger. Even when we were God's enemies, He made peace with us because His Son died for us. Yet something even greater than friendship is ours. Now that we are at peace with God, we will be saved by His Son's life. And in addition to everything else, we are happy because God sent our Lord Jesus Christ to make peace with us. And finally, from the Gospel according to John, story that most of y'all have heard before. Chapter 4, beginning with the fifth verse. Hear the word of God. And on his way, he came to the town of Sychar. It was near the field that Jacob had long ago given to his son Joseph. The well that Jacob had dug was, was there and Jesus sat down beside it because he was tired from traveling. It was noon. And after Jesus' disciples had gone into town to buy some food, a Samaritan woman came to draw water from the well. Jesus asked her, Would you please give me a drink of water? You are a Jew, she replied, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink of water when Jews and Samaritans don't have anything to do with each other? Jesus answered, You don't know what God wants to give you. And you don't know who is asking you for a drink. If you did, you would ask me for the water that gives life. Sir, the woman said, You don't even have a bucket. And the well is deep. Where are you going to get this life-giving water? Our ancestor Jacob dug this well for us and his, family and, and his family and animals got water from it. Are you greater than Jacob? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will get thirsty again. But no one who drinks the water I give will ever be thirsty again. The water I give is like a flowing fountain that gives eternal life. The woman replied, Sir, please give me a drink of that water. Then I won't get thirsty and have to come to this well again. Jesus told her, Go get your husband. The woman answered, I don't have a husband. That's right, Jesus replied. You're telling the truth. You don't have a husband. You have already been married five times, and the man you are now living with isn't your husband. The woman said, Sir, I can see that you're a prophet. My ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews say Jerusalem is the only place to worship. Jesus said to her, Believe me, the time is coming when you won't worship the Father either on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans don't really know the one you worship, but we Jews do know the God we worship, and by using us, God will save the world. But a time is coming, and it is already here. Even now, the true worshipers are being led by the Spirit to worship the Father according to the truth. These are the ones the Father is seeking to worship Him. God is Spirit, and those who worship God must be led by the Spirit to worship Him according to the truth. The woman said... I know that the Messiah will come. He's the one we call Christ. When He comes, He will explain everything to us. I am that one, Jesus told her. And I'm speaking to you now. The disciples returned about this time and were surprised to find Jesus talking with a woman. But none of them asked Him what He wanted or why He was talking with her. The woman left her water jar and ran back to town. She said to the people, Come and see a man who told me everything that I had done. Could he be the Messiah? Everyone in town came out to see Jesus. While this was happening, Jesus' disciples were saying to him, Teacher, please eat something. 
But Jesus told them, I have food that you don't know anything about. His disciples started asking one another, has someone brought him something to eat? Jesus said, my food is to do what God wants. He's the one who sent me and I must finish the work he gave me to do. You may say that there are still four months until harvest time, but I, but I tell you to look and you will see the fields are ripe and ready to harvest. Even now the harvest workers are receiving their reward by, bring, by gathering a harvest that brings eternal life then everyone who planted the seed and everyone who harvests the crop will celebrate together. So the saying proves true. Some plant the seed and others harvest the crop. I am sending you to harvest crops in fields while other, where others have done the hard work. A lot of Samaritans in town put their faith in Jesus because the woman had said, this man told me everything that I have done. They came and asked him to stay in their town and he stayed on for two days. Many more Samaritans put their faith in Jesus because of what they heard him say. They told the woman, we no longer have faith in Jesus just because of what you told us. We have heard him ourselves and we are certain that he is the Savior of the world. Amen. Praise God for these readings from His Word. Now, before I say anything else, before I say anything else, sermon-wise, let me tell you how glad I am to be with you this morning. I am delighted. But even more than that, I am, I am overjoyed by seeing y'all here. Especially knowing all the other stuff y'all could be doing because of the coronavirus. Right? I mean, like, I'm talking about, like, staying at home and not watching March Madness or risking infection just to grab the last few rolls of toilet paper in eastern Ohio. Trust me, even as we speak, God is taking note of your dedication and when it comes to the toilet paper, maybe the risk that you will be facing in the near future. And I hope by the time you leave this morning that you feel the risk was worth it. Because this morning we're going to look at one of those stories that we've all, we all know, we've all heard before, you know, familiar to folks that have been in the church for a while. And I'm talking about the story of the woman at the well. I mean, a lot of y'all knew what was going to happen before I, even, before I even read it. But what you all may not know is that there are really two stories here. Did you realize that? There are two stories. And with one actually being a story within a story. And even though, as we'll talk about in just a minute, the two have a lot in common, I think the difference is really important to us. And for that reason, for the next ten minutes or so, I mean, there's no basketball on later. I mean, what else are we going to do? We're going to look at this passage by John by first focusing on the bigger story. And then second, we're going to talk about that story within the story. And third, we're going to look at both of them, how both of them might relate to us. And even though I am well aware that what I'm about to say to you is not going to replace the XFL, it just might help us see ourselves as disciples of Jesus Christ a little clearer. And like I said, first it really starts with the bigger story. And that's the, the, the one we know, the one that comes to mind when we think of a woman at a well. And I'll tell you, I think that story can be broken into three different sections. For example, part one involves the initial exchange between Jesus and the woman. Now, the fact that Jesus is even talking to her is sort of a surprise. I mean, we're dealing with, what are we dealing with here? She's what? She's a Samaritan woman. Samaritan woman. And we all know the Samaritan women are no good. I mean, would you want your son dating a Samaritan woman, bringing a Samaritan woman home? <laughs> and so the fact that he's there with her is a, is a surprise. 
And after they meet, there's a lot of confusion, right, in the conversation. I mean, Jesus says something that she didn't understand. So she says something that doesn't make sense. And then Jesus says something else that she doesn't understand, and so she says something else. And yada, yada, yada. It's like they're talking past one another. But even though she is clueless when it comes to this little conversation, she didn't know what he's getting at by this water business. We understand, don't we? That he didn't talk about water at all. He's talking about something a whole lot more important. Now that's the initial exchange. And then in the second part of this story, well, I think that centers on what Jesus ends up saying to her. I mean, after they had, they had finished that who's on first kind of conversation, Jesus said to her, Believe me, the time is coming when you won't worship the Father either on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans don't really know the one you worship. But we Jews, we Jews do know the God we worship. And by using us, God will save the world. But the time is coming. And it's already here. Even now, the true worshipers are being led by the Spirit to worship the Father according to the truth. These are the ones God, the Father is seeking to worship Him. God is Spirit. And those who worship God must be led by the Spirit to worship Him according to the truth. Now that's what He said. And just think about what it means. He's saying that the time is going to come when God's going to do what? Man, he's going to change everything. In fact, that time is starting right now. And that through the living water he had talked about earlier, through that Holy Spirit, he was going to lead people into a new kind of worship. And he was going to reveal a new kind of truth. And he was going to offer a new kind of relationship. Man, he was bringing a new kind of life. And after this woman told him that Samaritans expected this to happen when the Messiah came, you remember what Jesus told her? You remember what he said? I am the one. And I'm speaking to you now. You see, in the second section, Jesus told the woman exactly what to expect and exactly how it was going to happen. And then in the third section, well, man, that was all about what the woman did and the response uh, that followed. Remember, according to John, a lot of Samaritans in that town put their faith in Jesus because the woman had said, this man told me everything I had done. They came and asked him to stay in their town, and he stayed there for two days. Many more Samaritans put their faith in Jesus because of what he said. They told the woman, we no longer have faith in Jesus because of what you told us. We have heard him ourselves and we are certain he is the Savior of the world. And so she went and she shared. And the people, her people, came and they believed. Now, in a nutshell, that's a bigger story, right? That's the one we know about. But if you remember when we read the passage just a little while ago, there was something else in there, right? It wasn't just about Jesus and, uh, and Samaritans. What I gave you right now, summarized right now, wasn't the entire passage because there was sort of this story within a story. In fact, one that if you took it completely out of the passage, it wouldn't affect the flow of the Samaritan woman at all. And this second story dealt with, you remember who he deals with? Deals with Jesus talking to who? Talking to Jesus talking to his disciples. And what's really cool is the two stories are very similar, with one exception. For example, that little conversation Jesus has with his disciples, it starts with an initial exchange, right? This time, Jesus is talking to his followers, and as they talk back and forth, there's a lot of confusion, right? And even though the woman, she was confused about what he meant by water, the disciples are confused by what he meant by, remember? By food. By food. Remember they said, he was talking about doing, about being, having food, and they said, well, somebody must have brought him a sandwich, 
right? You know, they were confused about this food business. And again, after the initial conversation, in the second part, Jesus made a statement. But instead of talking about the changes that had already come, that's what he says to the woman, how the good news made everything different, he zeroed in on what his followers were called to do in light of this change. In other words, Jesus told the disciples the role they could expect in this new spirit-driven world, right? According to John, he said, My food is to do what God wants. He is the one who sent me and I must finish the work that He gave me to do. You may say that there are still four months until harvest time, but I tell you to look and you will see the fields are ripe and ready to harvest. Even now the harvest workers are receiving their reward by gathering a harvest that brings eternal life. Then everyone who planted the seed and everyone who harvests the crop will celebrate together. So the saying proves true. Some plant the seed and others harvest the crop. I am sending you to harvest crops in fields where others have done all the hard work. Now that's what he said. He said that in this new age that was just dawning, that was being brought by the Holy Spirit, his disciples would have would play the role of harvesters, right? The guys who bring in the crop. In other words, recognizing that somebody had already prepared the soil, somebody had already planted the seeds, they would be the ones out in the field gathering the harvest together. And since the fields were ripe and since the fields were ready, right now was the time to do it. Of course, he wasn't talking about agriculture here, right? We know what he was talking about. Jesus told his disciples exactly what they were supposed to do now that the Spirit was leading people to believe. Leading like those Samaritans to believe. People like the woman. People like the folks in her hometown. He was telling them what his followers were expected to do. And once he said that, before the disciples could respond, you know that third part that we saw in the first story? The people started coming. And I'll tell you, I think that's really important. Because I think the third part is really up to us. And that's what I mean by application. You see, just like he told the disciples way back in the day, Jesus is telling us. You know what he's telling us? It's time to roll up our sleeves and get to, what's the word? Work. Thank you very much. Why? Why is he telling us to do that? Because look out those windows. The fields are ripe and the ready and the harvest is ready. In other words, people are ready to hear the good news. But not some stuffy, boring, arcane collection of shoulds and shouldn'ts. You know, done by people that never smile. You know, just grimace and look bored. You know, stuff that belongs under a dusty case in a museum. No, I'm telling you, they are ready to hear a red-blooded message of grace and mercy and compassion. And to hear it with energy and enthusiasm and passion. Man, they are ready to hear about a God who loves them before the foundation of the earth. And a, a Christ who saved them without their help or permission. And a Holy Spirit that still inspires His people. You see, they are ready. Man, they are desperate to hear the exact message that we have. And as harvesters, Man, it's our job to get out into the world and to do what? Share it. And getting out there is really important. Because Jesus never said we should wait for the harvest to come to us. You know, imagine a farmer. I, I lived in eastern Montana for a while. A lot of farms out there. You know what I never heard a farmer say? 
I'm going to sit in my living room and let the reaper, let the, uh, the crops come to me. You know, any of y'all farmers? What would you say to a farmer that says that? I'm going to wait till the combine comes into my living room. Then I'll harvest. They are crazy, right? The harvest is there. It's not in here. We need to go outside the walls and reach out to our families and our communities and our world. And even though it may be easy to assume that you do this by using words, right? We share the gospel by what we say. Well, I'm telling you, that's not true. You know how we can show how we can share godly compassion? You know how we can share godly compassion? Be a surprise. By being compassionate. Especially to those who don't deserve it. And I'll tell you something. We show godly, we share godly mercy. Every time we've got the courage, and it takes courage, to turn the other cheek and to walk the second mile. And we show godly grace when we choose to pull an Elsa. Y'all saw Frozen? When we choose to pull an Elsa, and as it relates to the past, do what to it? Now you're a mother, you've got to know this one. What, what does Elsa say? What is she saying? Let it go! Take our past and let it go! And brothers and sisters, we show godly love every time we decide to make these words of, from the Apostle Paul a checklist for our daily living. Paul wrote, Love is kind and patient, never jealous, boastful, proud, or rude. Love isn't selfish or quick-tempered. It doesn't keep a record of wrongs that others do. Love rejoices in the truth, but not in evil. Love is always supportive, loyal, hopeful, and trusting. Brothers and sisters, this is a decision we make. We can decide to be loving. You see, that's how we bring in the harvest, and you don't need to be a good public speaker or to have a seminary degree to do it. As a matter of fact, we can actually step out into the world. Step out into the world. Confident of two things that Jesus talks about right here. We can be confident that just like Jesus said, the hard work has already been done. Maggie, that should make you really happy. The hard work has already been done. The soil has already been prepared. The seeds have already been planted. Man, the plants have already grown. All we have to do is bring in the sheaves. That's one reason to be confident. And two, when those crops start coming in, and I believe they will, we're going to see lives transformed. We're going to see men and women take that good news and get excited about it. Imagine that, getting excited about the good news. And we're going to see him start passing it on to others, not unlike the coronavirus, only in a good way. As a matter of fact, we're going to see the world change. Do you believe that? When we start doing this, you believe it? We're going to see the world change. When we get off our pews, And do what disciples are called to do. And all this we know because of a woman at a well. And so there you have it. Of course, I'm not going to say that this message was as exciting as watching Ohio State play Maryland for the Big Ten Championship. Nor am I suggesting that it is as satisfying as finding the last pack of Charmin behind the paper towels. 
Still, I think this passage is pretty good. I mean, in the big story, we can learn a lot about both the good news and how it can change people. And in the story within a story, we can understand what the disciples, what disciples are called to do in this new spirit-driven world. And then by applying those stories to ourselves, we can get ready to move out into the fields and to bring in the harvest. That we can do. And I'll tell you, unlike watching basketball or buying toilet paper, no virus can stand in our way. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord God, thank you for the presence that you, you, you surround us with. Help us to recognize the opportunity we have. We have heard the message. We know that the Spirit is alive and well and living within us. We know you. Help us to see opportunities. To share it, not, not just with words, but through actions. Help us share compassion by being compassionate. Mercy by being merciful. Love by being loving. Help us to do that so that we can be out bringing in the harvest just as you've called us to do. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Now, let's reaffirm what we believe by saying together the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, Father, the Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven and was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and became truly human. For our sakes, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. And his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, and who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Would those who collect the offering, would you please come forward? I was, I was so, and your name is what again? Amanda. Amanda. I was telling Amanda before the service. Uh, you brought the offering up. Uh, I was at Cove over in Wharton for 13 years. Uh, 
it, it, the first item, they have a tradition with the offering that they don't bring the money up. They empty the plates in the back. And so after they collect the offering, they empty the plates and bring the empty plates back. And I'll tell you, the first time I took those plates, man, my first thought is, I don't think they're going to be able to pay me. <laughs> you know, this is the worst offering I have ever seen. Should we lock the doors and try it again? <laughs> but that was okay. Uh, now, y'all may be seated. Yes, I know there's a little asterisk, but let's, let's, let's sit down. You know, God's given us a, a wonderful, wonderful opportunity to gather around his table, to, to share in, in this communion. Uh, and, and this table is open to anybody who sees meaning in the elements. You see, although he isn't here with us physically, Jesus is really the host of the meal. You know, I'm going to be giving the, the bread and the cup to some of the elders and they're going to be bringing it to you. But, but we're sharing this with Jesus Christ. His presence is here. And, and every time we see that bread and, and hold that cup, we, we remember that presence, that he is here with us. We remember what he did for us when he was alive by living and dying for us. We remember what it, we have to look forward to because even Jesus said the time's going to come. When his kingdom arrives on earth, he compares it to a banquet where people will come from east and west, north and even south and share with him in, in fellowship and communion. So let me invite all of you to, to gather around the table, even though you'll be sitting in your seats, to gather around this table and to share in the presence of our Lord. Let's pray together. <laughs> the, uh, there's something going on out there. It's either in that room or it's in heaven. And uh, <laughs> the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks. Lord God, you are present here and we are absolutely grateful, my goodness gracious. In fact, we are a people who really rest on, on your promises. And there are promises, there are the promises we, see, we can see fulfilled in your dealings with folks in the past. I mean, you were there with your people Israel. You, you led them out of captivity. You guided them through the desert. You offered them direction so that they might live their lives. You gave them a land to be their own. And we remember that because you are a God who fulfills what you've promised. But we also know that, that consequences sometimes are paid when we wander away. Your people strayed from the path you laid out for them and they paid the consequences and some of those consequences were severe. But that didn't interfere with your promises. Oh no. You continue to be a God that, that remained close to your people. They were your children and you were their father. And for that we give you great thanks and we give you great praise. And therefore it's easy to join with all those people from the past who could affirm with joyful song the meaning of their faith. Holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Now when we say Hosanna, we think about your son Jesus Christ, our Savior. My goodness, you gave him to live for us. And through that life, you gave us an example that, that we, can, we can follow. Through the love he shared, by the compassion he showed, you gave us a, a template that can direct our lives. But then, when you led him to the cross and, and, and he died, we believe that we died with him. 
We who were called as your people, we died with him. And through that death, the power of sin were bro- was broken. Therefore, we have the opportunity to live a new life. And then when you caused him to rise again from the dead, you reminded us that death doesn't have the last answer. That there's life later. A resurrected life in your presence. And then through the ascension, we now know that He's with you. Interceding for us. Pleading our cause. It is with with great joy and, and great enthusiasm that we pray to you the same prayer that folks, the faithful, have prayed for generations. Saying, Christ has died Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Lord God, we are here because of your Holy Spirit. And for that Spirit, we give you thanks and praise. Not only does it flow through and around us, it changes us. That Spirit opens our eyes so that we might see, and our minds so that we might understand, and our hearts so that we might feel. Enable that Spirit to open our hands so that we might respond. Help us to be open to the Spirit guiding us into, f- into the future so that we might live for you as your servants. This we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who taught us to pray, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, on the night in which Christ was betrayed, after he shared a a simple meal with his disciples, He took the bread and after giving a little blessing, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body given for you. And in the same way, after they had shared the bread, he took the cup and into the cup he poured the wine. And he said, this cup represents the new covenant sealed by my blood. As often as you eat this bread and drink from this cup, you remember my death until I come again. Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy upon us. Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy upon us. Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, grant us your peace.
Remember the body of Christ was given for you. Remember the blood of Christ was shed for you. Lord God, thank you. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to share in in this communion. Remind us of what we've experienced here. We have we are united in your presence. Help us to take that unity out into the world so that we might be effective witnesses to your love and your mercy. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Now, let's close the service down by standing up and singing. Oh, man, if you didn't know the one in the middle, I know you know this one, right? Rock of ages, clap for me. I knew this before I was born. So let's all stand up and let's sing it.
Well, turn around and look at that clock back there. It's, it's almost quarter after. I got to tell you, I am really surprised that it's only quarter after. You know, when I was looking at the service, I thought, my goodness gracious, I could end up being here for a couple of hours. That looked like a lot of stuff going on. <laughs> One thing, though, I, 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 I want to share with you. Now, is it, uh, one of your daughters, the, you, it's your kids up there, right? Yes, I have three of the four. Up. You have three of the four. Yes. You want to identify the one that isn't yours? <laughs> the, the oldest boy. The I'm oldest boy isn't yours. So you have the little blonde girl. Yes. Okay. Just a, just a minute ago, I was looking up there uh, as we were singing, and I saw her face just there. And, and you know what, what came to mind as I saw her looking down from there? Teletubbies, you know, where the, where the, the, the sun is, is that, that child's little baby's face. And I looked out there and said, whoa, that's, that's kind of cool. Uh, so, well, I'm, I'm glad y'all were here. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. I'm going to give you a charge this morning. We shared this wonderful meal. We, as I said in the prayer, we're united by, by the Spirit with Christ as our leader. Let me challenge you just to get out in the world. And, and if the world is, is school, well, not anymore, but if the world <laughs> involves some school or work or home or family, get out in the world. And to share the love of God by being loving. By being loving. Let that be your challenge for the next week. And to inspire this walk, receive the blessing. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of His Holy Spirit be with you all. And the people of God said, Amen. amen. Oh, wait a minute. Wait, wait. wait. <laughs> I appreciate it. I appreciate it. But uh, we, we can... Even with coronavirus out there, uh, we, we can do it. We might be able to do it a little bit better, you think? Yeah. Okay. Let the people of God say amen. Amen. That's good. Yeah. <laughs>